Greg Fischel, I am so excited to finally interview you. We met back in the Ham Radio Roars presentation you gave years ago on weather, and I became a fan ever since. I appreciate that, but you know the, the memory I have of that is that that was so long ago that when I left that meeting, there was a T Rex just outside the building. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> well, there there are two things I really want to cover in this interview, and one is why it does it seem to be so hard to predict the weather in the Triangle area over other areas? Because I'm originally from Washington D.C., they have their own challenges. But it seems to be easier up there to predict than even here. And then the second one I want to cover is I really want to take people on a journey of your lifelong experience of getting into weather, falling in love with it, and how you were a pioneer in the weather field with education, information, and, of course, those wonderful puns. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm glad you used the adjective wonderful. Not everybody does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So let's start with just why is the weather in the Triangle area so unusual and seem to be so hard to predict? I think it's it's most difficult to predict in the season that we are, you know, getting into now, uh, because we are one of only three states uh, that has a warm current of water adjacent to a mountain barrier, and so and I'm talking about the Gulf Stream, so. Uh, we have a natural front right along our coast that anytime it gets cold, it's cold over land, and then the Gulf Stream warms the air above it, and so you end up with a, all this temperature contrast right along our coast, and this is why people in Baltimore, Washington, Philly, and Boston hate us because we're a breeding ground for the Nor'easters that then go up and dump on them, uh, but I have seen so many times when the uh, inland push of that warm ocean air it doesn't always get to exactly the same location. And so there are some instances where it doesn't make it to the triangle area. And so we end up with, you know, sleet, freezing rain or snow. Other times it does. And it's just a cold rain. And you can say on average, you know, that a lot of people talk about the snow line being between, you know, Durham and Roxborough. Uh, that may be an average position, but it doesn't work like that every time. And so I, I've, I remember being very honest with people in a rain snow situation where I said, if if you live near that boundary, wherever that boundary sets up, there's going to be somebody out there that's going to wake up tomorrow morning and think I'm an idiot, you know, because uh, <laughs> it, it can literally be a matter of miles between getting several inches of snow and just getting a cold rain. And it's very hard to nail down that exact position where that transition is going to occur. Yes. And then we have, of course, how it seems like it's going to snow and then it doesn't. And it's right. going to, you know, and then now the positives of our area is some of those tragic severe weather seem to come right up to us and hit our, our coast more and or our mountains more. Yeah, I mean, there, there are so many different, you know, cases. Uh, and, you know, while you bring up a couple that are perfectly legit, uh, then you think about the March of 84 outbreak that killed 57 people in North mm -hmm. and South Carolina, uh, the uh, Raleigh tornado of November of 1988, uh, the April 16th of 2011 outbreak. So those are all examples of where, you know, the Piedmont and the coastal plain were ground zero. You know, mm -hmm. so every situation is uh, is different. And, you know, the interesting thing about the weather here is that in all the years I lived in Raleigh, uh, I think I saw every extreme you can see, uh, the hottest temperature ever, the coldest temperature ever, at least on record, uh, the worst tornado outbreak, uh, multiple hurricanes. Um, uh, what else am I missing here? Uh, sleet. It, we had that. So a number oh, of the sleet sleet. storm. Uh, yes. Yeah. And then the, the snow, what was it? It seemed the, like three feet of snow. I don't the, all I remember. It was the yeah. 20 incher in January of 2000. Uh, and we've had, you know, really bad ice storms. I'll never forget the one in 02 that I woke up in the morning and the power was out and I called, uh, Elizabeth Gardner, you know, my former colleague at WRAL. And I said, Oh, I lost power here. And she said, yeah, you and 400,000 other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it really is quite a mix that, like you said, that interface is what gives the challenge. 
But then that's the excitement for someone like you because you got to really dig deep and you have to be work with them. And one of the signatures I think you brought to the table was the idea of saying, look, we just don't know. You know, this is what might happen. And I think that's an important piece of building integrity in the news is acknowledging what's going on with that. And then, of course, leading with the education. I I do not usually uh, toot my own horn at all. But if there's anything I'm proud of, of all the years in television, is that I ignored 95 percent of what the consultants told me to do. And it ended up working. Uh, I was told that people didn't want to be educated, that they just want to know if it's going to rain or not. Uh, you know, and, and, and I, I found exactly the opposite, you know, that people, you know, wanted to find out, uh, more about what are the different possibilities? Uh, why is there so much uncertainty in a given situation? Um, uh, and then I'm trying to remember here the other thing. Oh yes. They, they told me, well, never, never talk about what you're not sure of. And, and I'm sitting there going, I got more positive feedback from the times that I looked straight into the camera and said, I don't know. Yeah. Now I, I obviously don't want to come across as, Duh, I don't know. Right. <laughs> right. Right. But, uh, you know, like just last night, uh, the European model made a drastic, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen a more drastic change from one run to the next, uh, about what's, what the map's going to look like on December 23rd. And uh, it just goes to show that, you know, if you take any one of these model runs literally and just put all your eggs in that one basket, uh, you are going to pay. <laughs> You're going to yeah. pay dearly. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's also just the years of uh, what I'd say mistakes and and practice that you have. It's hard to re replace that with just technology. I mean, you've been looking out at that weather for a long time and building up your own combination of logic education and gut sense I, I i certainly try to do that and you know the uh the thing about the uh the uncertainty is that you know when we came up with the ensemble approach where for those of you that don't know uh we cannot observe the atmosphere perfectly even with all the satellites and instruments that are out there uh, we can't do it and so there's inherent error right off the bat in any model run and so the ensembles, what they do is they change the initial conditions of the model or the analysis 30, 40, 50 different extents, very small, but nonetheless different, and then run all the models out and see how sensitive the atmosphere is to those small changes. And if in five days it looks like a finger painting exercise, then you know that there's tons of uncertainty. But if all the solutions are still pretty close together in five days, then that tells you, oh, you got high confidence in this forecast. So this was the first time we were able to quantify the amount of uncertainty uh, in a forecast. Uh, and again, I think that's useful information uh, for people to know if, if they can take a forecast to the bank or whether or not they need to stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things the other brought up was just that we're kind of on a potential ice line, I remember, in that presentation. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and that's where, you know, we have just that right mix. And I had never thought of that before, that our area is almost an optimum for potential of ice if the conditions are correct versus snow. Yeah, we have these uh, cold air damming episodes where uh, uh, if, if very shallow cold air gets east of the Appalachian Mountains up in the northeastern U.S., there's nothing to stop it from draining southward east of the mountains. Uh, and so as a result, uh, you end up with a lot of low-level cold air, which is where we live, uh, but the rest of the atmosphere can be very warm or, or at least above freezing. And so it makes it quite easy to get these ice situations where it's, you know, you go up uh, two or 3,000 feet and the temperature is 45 degrees, but we don't live at two or 3,000 feet. We live yeah. at the ground. And if it's 28 or 29, then you end up with ice. Yeah. And that's where I've enjoyed being part of what's called Skywarn, which you all have used, where there are citizens that volunteer. It's real active in the amateur radio uh, because of that radar, you know, it's not going level. It's going up an angle. It's going in a range and yes. there can be holes in it. Absolutely. And uh, and the thing about it is there's just no substitute for human eyes. Now, yeah. there uh, 
there is one uh, a parameter with Doppler radar that's available now. It's called the correlation coefficient. And basically what it is looking at, the, the shapes and sizes of whatever the radar is bumping into, are they all uniform? Are they all similar? Or are they all different? Well, if they're all different, that means you probably have debris and sofas and chairs and you know all that sort of stuff flying around. So that has made it a little bit easier uh at least close into the radar to say, yeah, we're very confident there's a tornado on the ground here. But you're right. Once you get out some distance, then, you know, unless the debris is up at 10,000 feet, you're not going to see that. And so, again, there's just no substitute for human eyeballs saying, yep, I am in that spot and I'm looking here and there it is. <laughs> yeah. The next thing I want to talk about is transition from working with a team of people to now you are <laughs> the official weather and several where people can get a free version that's sponsored and then they can get a paid version with your Patreon for a deeper dive. Exactly. Um, you know, I know that uh, and, and I, I totally get this, that a lot of people think, well, you know, I've never had to pay for a weather forecast before. You know, why should I do it now? If you want something more in depth than what somebody can do in three minutes, right. uh, which is generally what I had on television, then uh, then, you know, so I guess it's one of those things where you get what you pay for. You know, it's right. like uh, you, know, you pay a little extra and you get a little bit more detail. And again, for, for some people, the three dollars a month is worth that. Mm -hmm. And for other people, they're not as interested in all the meteorology and so forth. And so it doesn't make sense for them to pay for something that they're not going to use and they're not interested in. So uh, I totally get both both approaches. Uh, being older now and being on a fixed income, obviously, yeah. the, the, the more subscribers, the better. <laughs> yes, yes. And yeah. I'll, I'll put the links below. But then, of course, if they want just kind of the get to the point quick, you have sponsored content, too. Yes. Uh, Blanton's Air Plumbing and Electric, which is based in Fayetteville, but they're now expanding into the uh, Triangle area. Uh, came to me about a year ago and, and asked me if uh, I'd be interested in being their spokesperson. And the more I learned about the company, the more impressed I was. And uh, so we're now in our second year uh, together. And uh, I, I usually post uh, e both Instagram and Facebook videos Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mm -hmm. uh, that they sponsor. Uh, and uh, then also uh, if they post something on their Facebook page and they want me to share it, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, and, and I had a chance to hang out with all of them the day before Thanksgiving, they had their state of the company meeting at the botanical gardens in Fayetteville. And uh, I'm just really, really impressed. I'm not just saying this, but you know, just the culture and uh, the fact that they give back to the community and they support each other. And it was you know, it's one thing to observe from afar. It's something else to actually be amongst those people and see how they actually operate. And I was very impressed. Yeah. What's available now that wasn't before is we can be the new media, you know, the individuals. And you've moved from a team helping you to doing it all yourself. But it's even more important to be accurate, consistent, integrity, all those when you don't have a big supporting advertising and fancy tech than before. And you've got several added values you give. One, like you said, you have extra time. Mm -hmm. And two, you also have that deep dive, the $5 a month available too, if they really want the real deep study uh, into the weather as well. Talk a minute about how it's different when you wake up every day mm -hmm. and your tech support you're the business, you're the marketing department, and you're the generator of it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, because I remember when I worked with Mike Mays, when we were on the same shift for years, we had an interesting little uh, approach that we both took is that he and I both prepared our forecast independently without conversing, sharing, anything. And then once we were both done, then we got together. And if there were some differences, like on a certain day, uh, then he would tell me, you know, what he what his reasoning was. I would tell him what mine was. And there were some times when, you know, he, uh, you know, brought up something that I hadn't thought of. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up going with his, you know, his idea and vice versa. Uh, and so the, the neat thing about that department was none of us felt like we had cornered the market on on accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the consensus was many, many times the way to go. 
Uh, we all respected each other's abilities, what everybody brought to the table. And it was just a really, really good environment. Uh, now, uh, other than some casual phone conversations and text messages, mm -hmm. uh, I don't have that, like you said, right. anymore. And so, uh, and, and I will be very honest with you, Martin, when I started this on the 1st of August, I really questioned in my own mind, mm -hmm. do I have it in me to do this right. on a regular basis? Right. And the more I did it, the more I rediscovered my passion for the weather uh, which had been dormant for a couple of years, <laughs> but now it's back in full force. And I look forward every day now to, you know, looking at the weather and, and, uh, you know, figuring out how I'm going to present it and then actually presenting it. Uh, and, uh, I couldn't be happier. Yeah. And not only that, it, in some ways it's easier to be connected to your audience because instead of reporting to a boss, it's your patrons and it's your sponsor. And you've, in some ways you might have more bosses, but it's more connected directly to the people and uh, very clearly a feedback loop because you take feedback and then you generate content off of it from the patrons. Yes. Uh, in fact, I actually invited that. And uh, some people have said, you know, can you do a, a bonus weather video on this? And then I'll get to that subject, you know, as soon as I can. One of the things that I've taken seriously my whole life or my whole professional career is that when you're on television, you are representing the science of meteorology. You're representing all those PhDs and so forth that are out there busting their gut every day to, to teach and to do research and to publish papers and all that stuff. And it's like, I don't want to misrepresent them. It's like if there's uh, something that I'm not exactly sure of, I will research the heck out of it to make sure that whatever I say, you know, is scientifically correct. And if it's, you know, if I find out that it's not, uh, I used to tell the professors at NC State, I said, if you ever hear me say something that, that you don't think is quite right, don't sit around the water cooler and uh, and just talk amongst yourselves. Call me, mm -hmm. you know, or email mm -hmm. me or whatever, because I said mm -hmm. the last thing in the world I want to do is say something that is not exactly the way it should be said. Yeah, outstanding. Now I'd like to go down memory lane. And <laughs> this is the second part. I think we've introduced a little bit, but really excited. Where did you first grab the spark of weather uh, in your life? Uh, it, it, we're both older, so it might take a little work, <laughs> and we can't guarantee accuracy and everything, right? But uh, where did this journey initially begin? Well, I know that early in my life, and I'm talking about, you know, three, four or five years old, that the weather seemed to occupy a lot of my emotions. Uh, I remember one time sitting at the dinner table, and this was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and, and our, the tree in the front yard was bent halfway over. And uh, and I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, am I going to die? You know, right. uh, snow, I always loved it uh, from the first time I ever remember seeing it. Uh, I still think that 32 in snow is way prettier than 33 in rain. Um, and my dad was one of these people that when a thunderstorm came along uh, and lightning struck five feet outside the house and there was like that that immediate clap of thunder, he didn't care how close he was. I was in the bathroom hiding behind the commode. You know? <laughs> so uh, it just seemed to occupy a lot of emotion. And then the thing that that got me was I was channel surfing uh, which back in 1969 didn't take long. <laughs> and uh, there was a show on public television called The State of the Weather, The Shape of the World. And it was produced at Penn State. And there was a gentleman named Elliot Abrams, who uh, was the senior vice president of AccuWeather for like 35, 40 years. But uh, he would do a seven and a half minute presentation about not only the forecast, but the science behind it. Uh, he had a very cool, I thought, sense of humor. He, he loved puns as well. And, uh, you know, that's when I started to like really just follow it day in and day out. And I would keep records of their forecasts versus other forecasts and how accurate they were. And then they, most times they ended up being more accurate. Once I got to high school, I thought, my gosh, Penn State has one of the top meteorology departments in the country, and it's in state. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mom and dad were going, yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, and, and and so I ended up going there and, uh, you know, getting my degree. And 
Uh, and and the th- neat thing about Penn State, too, is it wasn't all just equations and theory. There was a lot of that, but a lot of those professors wanted to make sure that you knew that there were applications to those equations, how they actually fit into the real world. And uh, and that was that to me kept me going. You know, as long as I know that there's an end game that's useful, uh, then I can tolerate just about anything. Uh, but there were some professors that just relished in the theory and didn't ever really want to test it to see if it worked in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't uh, the most uh, social butterfly, if you will, in high school and college. And so a lot of Friday and Saturday nights, I was up in the weather observatory plotting maps. And I honestly didn't feel like I was missing anything. I felt like right. this is this is where I need to be. <laughs> weather was your friend. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And then from there, how, you graduated. And then where did your career start? Well, my first job was with a company called Mesomet, which was sort of a or an abbreviation for mesoscale meteorology. And it was in Chicago. And one of my friends at Penn State who had graduated six months before I did had taken a job there. And so he recommended it. And uh, over the summer, uh, I flew out there and uh, and interviewed. And of course, I had never been in a city as big as Chicago and uh, well, yes, I've been in big cities before, but I had never considered the possibility of actually living in one, you know. Right. Uh, and at first uh, I thought, I'm not sure this is this is for me. And then I flew up to uh, Duluth, Minnesota, for another interview. And uh, this is like in early, I don't know, maybe mid to late June, something like that. And the ice had just melted off Lake Superior two weeks earlier, <laughs> and it was overcast and cold. And and then I flew back to Chicago and spent a day with my friend. And we walked along Lakeshore Drive, and the sun was out, and it was reflecting off Lake Michigan and the skyscrapers. And I thought, you know what, this is worth a shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so uh, it was an interesting arrangement. Uh, for those of you that are older, you may remember John Coleman did the weather on Good Morning America. And so my boss had an agreement with uh, ABC that we could use their equipment as long as we didn't interfere with their operations. And so uh, we had you know, radio station clients. We had trucking unions, interstate railways, golf courses, uh, anybody that had an economic need for weather information. Um, and then one day, one of my radio clients in Martinsburg, West Virginia at four o'clock in the morning said, have you ever thought about TV? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I saw myself on TV once and thought it would be a public service to stay out of the business. (laughs) (laughs) When they they say a a face for radio. Yes. The perfect, perfect face for radio. I, and this is where I think we all have moments in our life where we feel like there was intervention from something outside of ourselves right um so the interesting thing was that one of my best friends from penn state was going to graduate school at northern illinois university in DeKalb, which is about an hour west of chicago and they had a broadcast program mm-hmm. where they produced a newscast every night and he said well greg he said, why don't you come over here one afternoon and we'll help you make a tape and and that you can send it off uh to this station in salisbury maryland that was a startup and so uh, I went over there and made a tape, and I stood in front of one plexiglass-covered map of the United States for three minutes, made up a fictitious snowstorm coming up the East Coast, and sent it off. And the guy in Salisbury, the GM, was dumb enough to hire me. And, <laughs> uh, and I later found out that a lot of the stockholders were dead uh, against me because they felt like, hey, we're a startup. We need somebody with experience and credibility. And here this guy has never been on TV before. He's wet behind the ears. And this is not going to work. And the other guy said, no, I think I I see something. And mm-hmm. so that's how that came about. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that television station went into receivership. Uh, there were some financial problems uh, within the first year. And so... Uh, uh, Ann Devlin, who was a reporter at WRL years ago, uh, took a job. She was a Salisbury too. She took a job at WRL 
And when she found out they were hiring a meteorologist, uh, she dropped my name into the hat and was very encouraging. And I think that had a lot to do with me getting hired at WRAL. And then I finally stopped being a vagabond. You know, I felt like I was going to switch jobs every year, you know. Right. And uh, and so that was the beginning of a long spell. Excellent. Now, you, you shared a little story of one of your early mistakes at WRAL. And I don't know if you'd be willing to do it, but... Uh, which one? Uh, it was, <laughs> right, right, that's right. But you were new. And uh, would you share that now? Because I think it was a great story when we met in person and you were chatting about things. This was very early on, like within a week or two of when I started. And it was in the summer. It was like June of 1981. And... Uh, I made the comment on the air. I said, uh, great weekend coming up, plenty of sun, plenty of heat, no rain. And I didn't know that the area was in the midst of a drought. And so this uh, uh, gentleman from Pukway, Verena, sent a note to the uh, TV station saying, fire that new meteorologist. He must be living in a six by six cell block with no windows, oblivious to what's going on in the world. And I remember going to the news director after reading this. I had tears in my eyes. And, and he said, Greg, he says, you got to toughen that skin up a little bit. <laughs> but it did make me aware of the fact that good weather is very individual. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're a farmer, sometimes good weather is rain. <laughs> right. And, and so it, it made me aware of these different perspectives. And so I could say, hey, from a recreational standpoint, this looks like a great weekend. You can go to the pool, play tennis, play golf, whatever. But we are very short on rain. And it certainly would be helpful if at some point we could get some, you know, and that way everybody knew that I was at least trying to empathize with their whatever their situation was. Yeah, that's a that's a great story. And and <laughs> what it taught you is greater empathy for your audience, which yes. is really important. And that's one of the signature styles I remember is you would say, you know, <laughs> for these people, this is good news. For these people, it's not so good news. Right. Exactly. And, you know, Martin, there's a if I can just interject here yeah. for a second. This is a, a thing about me that very few people know. When I first got into television, there were two issues with me. Number one, I was an introvert. Nobody believes that, but I was. And I didn't want to be recognized. Mm -hmm. And uh, if if I walked down the street, I would purposely look at the ground instead of straight ahead, hoping that I wouldn't make eye contact with anybody. Uh, and if somebody made a comment like, oh, it must be nice to have a job where you can be wrong all the time and still get paid. I didn't think that was funny. Right. I took that right. as a direct insult. You know, right. not only about me, but about my, you know, my profession. And so I was very sensitive. And so in 1989, when Bob DeBartolaman decided to retire, they came to me and offered me the job. And this is what people don't know. Initially, I turned it down. Uh -huh. And the reason I turned it down was I figured if I can't handle the attention I'm getting doing weekends and mornings, right. uh, the night shift is going to put me under. Yeah. And so... Then I sort of thought about it for a few weeks, and I thought, is this one of those situations where the good Lord is putting something in my lap, and yeah. 20 years from now, I'm going to look back and wonder what if? Yeah. So I went back to the general manager, and I said, can we try this for a year, and if I don't like it, I can leave, and if you don't like me, you can get rid of me? And he yeah. said, sure. Sure, yeah. we can do that. I tried something one day. I was walking into a grocery store, and I just decided that I was going to look straight ahead with my shoulders back. Mm -hmm. And if I made eye contact with somebody, I was going to say something to them before they said anything to me. And it changed my life. Yeah, It literally changed my life. And it got to the point where when I went to give a talk to a civic group or a school or whatever, I was looking forward to it because I get to meet new friends today, you know? Right. Uh, and and I, I also kid about the fact that TV was God's way of saying to me, if I can't get you to come out of your shell any other way, I'm going to put you on television. That'll fix you. <laughs> right, right. No, that's a That's a yeah. great story. Uh, and it's also a story to understand that, uh, you know, we're all human inside. We all have our vulnerabilities and everything else. But we also, as a career, need to develop a certain level of shell. <laughs> we see right. I do public speaking and professional training, and she goes, they don't know you're soft and gooey inside. <laughs> <laughs> but we all have to develop our version of that and know when to use it and how to adjust with it. So I think that's a great story of your career of 
breakthroughs along the way and the experience of making mistakes and learning from them. The thing about but, making mistakes and learning from them, if a lot of what I learned about forecasting over the years from when I, is from when I was wrong. But the key is that if if a forecast goes awry and you take the attitude that, oh, well, I'm human. Mm -hmm. Humans make mistakes. Let's go on to the next one. You are condemned to making that same mistake again. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to care enough about the mistake to go back and look at it and study it and say, next time when I see something similar to this, how am I going to handle it then? Mm -hmm. What am I going to look for? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's that conscientiousness, I guess, you know, that that allows you to improve. But uh, never accept mediocrity uh, or, or never just say, oh, I'm human. I'm going to make mistakes and I'm happy to make the same mistake again because you'll never grow. Mm -hmm. You'll never learn anything. Yes. And I, I know now from chatting with you that you, if, if something's off, you're a pit bull to reanalyze it. It's kind of like the military analyzing a crash and going, OK, <laughs> how do we get here? What's the structure? What do we learn from it? What's the takeaway? And I think that's what keeps you vibrant and uh, why so many people are, are now still flocking to hear your weather, to to join your Patreon, to uh, support what's going on because you have a little more time. You have more ability to go further if you want to, to go a deep dive. There isn't a fire occurring right at this time that's breaking in and that has to have precedence. And there's a place for both of those. Yes. And, uh, you know, I just posted something on Patreon uh, early this morning, very early this morning, <laughs> uh, about the people. I have some very Good, excuse me, good friends that dibble and dabble in longer range forecasting, like, you know, maybe two to three weeks out. And while I admire their attempts and, and sometimes there's some, you know, some good stuff that comes out of it. I would argue that, especially in the South, where snow is a very sensitive issue, if you make a random comment like, oh, this is the kind of a pattern that can bring frozen precipitation to the Dixie states. Mm -hmm. Well, then you've got people in nine or 10 states that are now in an uproar. Mm -hmm. And even if there is frozen precipitation down the road, the amount of those 10 states that it covers is probably a very small percentage, which means everybody else is sitting there thinking, oh, that, that forecast was wrong. They were wrong again. Yeah. And, and I'm sitting there going, I wonder sometimes if we are our own worst enemy is that, you know, we need to realize where we are we've come a long way we've made a lot of improvements but we have a heck of a long way to go right and you know we need to realize what our limitations are and not make these bold statements way out in advance and and then have half or three quarters of them not come true and it just damages our reputation uh well, and you know well i i have to say i i grew up in dc and i believe Many factors have damaged just news in general because they put so much of commentary first instead of what actually happened. I would grew up where, you know, the Columbo, what are the facts? Give me the facts first. Let me think for myself. And that's and we could wax poetic of the cause of that forever. But uh, I professionals I know all over have to listen to almost every news station just figure out, did it rain or not? You know, what right. the news equivalent, you know, I mean, did they bomb them or not? What actually happened? And I think there's, there's a real, I don't know how to change it in the main media because they're kind of locked in with having to get the ads going. And now they have the pressure of social media and they believe that the drama over information is critic is the only way to go. That's right. why I have, in some ways, more hope for individuals like you, where, you know, it's my own show. Yeah, I, I need to provide them something that's useful and beneficial, or they're not going to keep supporting me. Right. And, you know, I, I used to give a talk called the, the scientific method is not just for scientists. And uh, I'll, I'll keep this short, but uh, the scientific method basically has three steps. You have a hypothesis, which is what you think the truth is. Then you test the hypothesis. And the, by the way, the best way to test it is to try to prove it wrong. Mm -hmm. And only upon failing to do that, do you accept your hypothesis as your conclusion. 
And so I think we live in a world now where with social media, cable news channels and talk radio, everybody has an echo chamber that they can run to to hear exactly what they want to hear and see exactly what they want to see. Right. And the thing about it is, I, I think it's useful every now and then to say, you know, I've had this opinion or this belief for 20 or 25 years. Is there the remotest of possibilities I could be wrong? <laughs> right. You know, and, and delve into it. And if you find out you were wrong or you change your mind, it doesn't mean you're wishy-washy. It doesn't mean that you, you know, abandon your standards or your, your morals or whatever. It simply means that you did an evaluation. You found out things were different than you thought they were. And you grew and you gained wisdom through the experience. That's all good stuff. Yeah. It's all positive stuff, yeah. but we don't frame it like that anymore. Right. And it's what you've been doing in weather. And now you're independent. You have more chance to do it. You know, whatever you want to do, it's it. And really understand that we are, there are a lot of us hungry for what actually happened. What's the fact of the weather? What's, is it, is it going to snow at Christmas or not? Oh, we don't know. There are too many variables. Okay. Right. I, I trust that guy over the, someone say, Stay tuned because we might have snow when there were, you know, when they know darn well the probabilities about, you know, 0.001. Right. I uh, I long for the good night, David. Good night, Chet. Right. Good right. night for NBC News. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, understand. And, and those were the days when, you know, really back in those days for national, international news, you had a half hour. Yeah. A day. And that was all you had. You know, yeah. uh, they didn't have time to interject opinion. Uh, and I wasn't Walter Cronkite like during Vietnam, like the first journalist to actually express an opinion. Yeah. About I think that was a, yeah, a turning point. That was right. a big deal. But the thing you point is, in fairness to all the news, is they had time to do research and prepare because it's one block of time. There's one paper coming out. There's one announcement occurring. So you actually had time to dig deeper. Now it's 24-7 and you're competing with the people as a news person with the people on Facebook, on YouTube and everything else. Exactly. And you know, everybody wants to be the first. And yep. do you remember when when Reagan was shot and uh, I was working for an ABC station at the time? So Frank Reynolds was the the anchor covering that. And uh, they announced that uh, that Brady, I can't remember his first name, uh, but uh, that he had died mm -hmm. and uh, and then later found out that he was alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Frank Reynolds literally on the air just said something to the effect. Can we please get this right? Yeah. You know, and so somebody wanted to be the first to say that he had died and yeah. they didn't verify their sources. And, and then, you know, it made Frank look dumb because, you know, he had announced the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like this this whole compulsion to be first. And the, a colleague of mine that used to work at the National Weather Service in Raleigh, Kermit Keeter, uh, he adhered to this mantra and i have ever since he said I'd rather be right than first right yeah uh, that's great i do have to tell you i was staying two blocks for where reagan was shot and heard the shot no kidding yeah i was in dc uh for the summer and i wanted i, I wanted to work at radio shack and live independently i was unusual child <laughs> you know so, <laughs> so they let me live in my school which was two blocks away from that exact location i mean i can see it now and i somehow i was there and and heard something that goes that sounds like a gunshot you know and wow. i would go down past that on connecticut to my job at radio shack so yeah it's a and i think you're right is there is a market for people like yourself committed to what is the most accurate data I can provide? Right. And I think there's a group hungry for that information. And I'm excited because there's room for the other. I mean, if you just want commentary and stay in your echo chamber, the risk of an echo chamber, I do want to tell you, is you then identify with issues and you become less of a human being. You narrow yourself into a little tunnel and the richness to me of life and to make it interesting and exciting is finding I'm wrong and reinventing myself, you know, going, oh, I've now attached myself to this. 
oh, let's break that free. And then I grow and, and my life becomes more meaningful and richer. So I think the, the echo chamber has almost a guaranteed sort of social narcissism depression that it creates if you don't disrupt it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I remember when I was at IBM, the book about Watson, uh, the founder of IBM said, I always surround myself with people that kind of piss me off. You know, because they're, they're going to be opening me up to ideas I don't see and I don't understand. And I think that is a commitment you bring to weather that I enjoy the most because, OK, I might be wrong. What can I learn from that? And that's going to keep you vibrant and relevant and worth uh, subscribing to, participating and being involved with. Well, you know, I, I appreciate that. I uh, I had a. Uh, quite a change of an opinion on a major issue about 10 or 12 years ago. And and I hope this doesn't cause half your audience to, to turn right. off here. Uh, but I uh, was a, a climate change skeptic uh, for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I woke up one morning and realized that I was allowing my political ideology at the time to dictate my opinion about a science issue and that that was wrong. Right. And so once I actually started reading the peer reviewed literature and interviewing the scientists that were doing the research and even going back to my basic textbooks at Penn State, uh, this is fundamental atmospheric chemistry. Right. You know, I mean, we yes, CO2 is a very small part of the atmosphere. But how many people realize that without the natural amount of CO2, the Earth would be an uninhabitable snowball? Mm -hmm. The average temperature of the planet would be 60 degrees Fahrenheit colder. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it isn't just CO2. It's like methane, nitrous oxide, water vapor. But, you know, a small percentage uh, has a big influence. And and so but at the same time, I tried to make people realize that, you know, while I accept the basic science of this, that I don't want to be one of these people that goes out there and says, oh, the sky is falling. We're all going to be dead tomorrow because we're not. Uh, and, and there, there's a, a good friend of mine at MIT, one of the big giants in our field, Kerry Emanuel, that put it very well, I think. He said, if we can find a way to minimize the risk without harming people, mm -hmm. why couldn't we all buy into that? Mm -hmm. You know, well, and that's the key. We have to balance that, not just go to extremes. Right. And also the fact of understanding is unless we can have honest discussion on it, we won't find what are the root causes of it. We'll just grab something and go, well, that's politically popular and run right. with it. Because yeah, there exactly. could be cycles involved in the earth. I, I remember seeing your graph and saying, look, it's a shift and it's over time. But do I know exactly what all the variables causing of it is? No, we need more research. We need more discussion. And I do believe from talking to scientists, I met so many that are saying, I can't even discuss that anymore because I could lose my job, right. <laughs> lose my grant. These are scientists now right. are being uh, dragged into, oh, that's my political agenda. So I think it's important. Maybe the path is more scientists that find a way to be independent, <laughs> you know, yes. to find a way to get a safer space to be so that they can, because if somebody, let's say a scientist today, were challenging that with some evidence that maybe this is a cycle, but there's something behind it bigger or something else, I guarantee their, their funding might go away. Yep. And we, you know, I think we've lost the ability overall as a society to engage in constructive conversations with people of differing views. Yep. Uh, and, you know, and the thing about it is, I mean, I need to keep testing my hypothesis, like even though, uh, you know, I accept the basic science, you know, of, of, of climate change, I always, when I read something from somebody who's, you know, in the science field that is contrary to that, then I delve into that. It's like, I don't ignore it. You know, I actually, you know, want to learn more about, you know, where that person is coming from. And I always try to verify what, if somebody, you know, doesn't accept the science, uh, I try to verify a lot of the points that they bring up, like it has been hotter than it is now. Mm -hmm. There has been more CO2 in the air than there's been now. There are natural cycles that have occurred for millions of years. You know, mm -hmm. all that's true. 
Mm -hmm. And the only difference with this, as opposed to all those other times, is that we are observing these changes over a much, much shorter time scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's, that's one of the key reasons why it makes sense that this, you know, human influence uh, is having an impact. And I guess the only question is, you know, nobody can be sure how much of an impact it's going to have, but, uh, you know, we have seen an uptick in, in some of these uh, extreme events. Uh, I, I don't like it when I hear every time there's an extreme event that somebody says, oh, that's just more evidence. Hey, there have been crazy weather events for centuries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? Well, they're destroying their own credibility. When the, yes. I've seen evidence where, you know, here's the map of what it would be. And, and there was overlay going, well, let's call this climate change. No, right. let's call this what it is. Yes. And and they're just destroying their own credibility over, again, what happened and then what is my interpretation? And these are two separate things. What happened is we're seeing it. If we look at the long thing, we're seeing more huger swings in weather than we did 200 years ago. You know, if you look at it like this and then my interpretation on this is it could be human interaction. If they right. did that, we'd have people potentially trusting the news more, but right. they don't. They've got to overlay their agenda on either side. And I'm, right. I'm looking at all the media. Oh, I, I, I agree. One. Yeah. And I think that's important. That's why I have so much faith in people like you and others where uh, seem to be committed to the best they can accurately providing what they know. And I'm uh, my vision for the future is a uh, open source protocol for citizen reporters committed to accurately reporting what's going on in the countries where they can do it, not be right. hung or shot for doing it. Right. And that's why I've, I've done some writing and work on that and hope to meet more. But my beginning hope is at least we can address the weather that way. What's, what do we know? What do we not know? And uh, what is the, your interpretation? And when you present it, you go, here's what I see. And here's my interpretation of it. So I can go, Oh, I see something different, Greg, you know? And I remember doing features about the, the trends in climate at the RDU airport where, uh, like one of the signals of of, uh, of increased greenhouse gases is that the nights warm quicker than the days do. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that actually happen at the airport. But I said, the other thing we have to consider here is that the RDU airport is not the same animal it was 30 years ago, is that there's more buildings, there's more tarmac. Mm -hmm. uh, the sighting of the instrumentation changed uh, in the 1990s uh, mainly to accommodate the needs of the aviation industry. Mm -hmm. But the siting of this instrumentation is adjacent to runways. And in the summertime, those runways get hot. And when the wind blows across them toward the instrumentation, it's going to have an effect. And uh, even as recently as a couple of weeks ago, it was a sunny day where there were no fronts around. The, you know, the air mass was uniform. And every station to the north, east, south, and west of RDU was 55 and RDU was 59. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. There's obviously something going on there. Right. You know, and that's and it not could be more change. concrete. It could be different sensors, like you right. said. Exactly. So I think when when I bring up the fact that okay, I could just say, yep, another example of climate change. Yeah. But when I know for a fact that there are other influences in yeah. that particular case, and I mention them, then at least people know that I'm not just going full bore with the agenda. You know, that I'm actually trying to look at all the scientific angles to this thing as to what could be causing this trend. One more thing I want to mention, and we'll uh, wrap up because sure. this has been so fun, is there's another aspect of your, your background and your experience, and it involves an instrument that <laughs> you shared with me, started by standing on a box or something like that. Would you share that with people? Because I think that rounds out the interest of you. <laughs> My mom and dad took me to uh, parades and uh, when I was young, and, and my dad was actually the chairman of the Loyalty Day Parade in Lancaster, PA. And I was fascinated by the sousaphones, uh, this you know big thing that was wrapping around these, these guys. And so I decided I wanted to play that instrument. And so in fourth grade, they had to put me on top of two phone books and rest the tuba in a trash can for me to reach the mouthpiece. Uh, 
and so I started playing in fourth grade and, and played all the way through uh, uh, high school. And one of my greatest experiences was that there was something called district band uh, where you would try out. And, you know, if you were good enough, then, you know, they select you and you'd all get together for three days and perform and so forth. And uh, so my senior year, I finally decided, OK, I'm going to give this a shot. So there were 25 of us trying out and they were going to pick eight. OK, so one through seven goes down. My name isn't mentioned. And I figure, well, you know, I tried. I'm number eight. <laughs> so I barely, barely sneak in. Then when we get to the actual festival, the district band festival, they retry us out and they moved me up to second share, wow. which then qualified me to go to regional band. And I ended up moving up to second share there. And uh, and this was really the first time that I had really applied myself, you know, I mean, really tried to get better. <laughs> and uh, and so that was a great great experience and my only regret at penn state is that i didn't join the blue band i uh, uh i was right. worried about the time commitment but uh you know that would have been a great experience and then i took 20 years off and i belonged to a church in raleigh and i knew they were going to start a brass band so i went to a store called the tuba exchange in durham uh -huh. that's all they sell that's is tuba. They sold. Yeah. Wow. and uh, bought an old beat-up horn and it looked awful but it didn't sound too bad and then uh after i knew i was going to you know, stick with this. I wanted to, you know, upgrade to a better horn. And this is one experience that I'll never forget is that I was visiting my dad in Lancaster. And as I was going out the door to return to Raleigh, he handed me an envelope and he said, don't open this until you get home. And when I got home, I opened it and it was a check for 2000 bucks. Oh my God. And that was, that was to go buy the new horn. Wow. Wow. That's Good great. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and you're in a band now. There's two groups down here: the North Myrtle Beach Community Band, uh, and two conductors that you know couldn't be more different. But they're both just wonderful people. Yeah, yeah <laughs> sense I of think, humor. They yeah. challenge us, but they also encourage us. Right. Uh, and the music selection is great. Uh, and then uh, there's a smaller group called Festive Brass uh -huh. of North Myrtle Beach, which is just uh -huh. a thirty piece brass band. Mm -hmm. And so I joined that about a month ago, and, and we performed three times in the last couple of weeks. And uh, now we're sort of on break until January. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, – and, and I'm one of these people that is affected emotionally by music. I mean, there are yeah. pieces of music that no matter how many times I hear it, at the same point in the piece, I'll get chills. Yeah. And people that aren't actually uh, emotionally affected by music, you know, they just sort of look at me like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. That's okay. My wife will watch field of dreams and say, you're, you're going to cry again, aren't you? <laughs> 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 yeah. So I have my own weak points in those areas too. And then one, one loyalty that exceeds logic or science is the Mets. You, you have to mention uh. that to round yourself out. Uh, and they, I want to give them credit. You're loyal through all weather, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, my uh, my dad was a Mets fan from day one, from the 1962, and uh, he loved Casey Stengel, and you know he he was their manager in the early days. I was a Phillies fan because the Phillies were closest to Lancaster, and then Tom Seaver came along, and he became my boyhood hero. And the thing I loved about Tom was that he was not only obviously very good at what he did, but he just seemed to be a good guy with good standards and he was very cerebral about pitching. I mean, pitching mm. was a science to him mm. and his trademark became the fact that his knee at the end of a game would be covered in dirt because he was pushing off with his legs so much. Mm -hmm. And that gave him a lot of the, the power for his pitches. And so I switched to the Mets in the beginning, not the end, but the beginning of 1969, having uh -huh. no clue what right. was going to happen at the end of the year. And I will never forget the, the day the Mets won the World Series against the Orioles. A good friend of mine uh, in school was an Orioles fan. And I got on the bus and I asked the bus director, I said, where's John? And he said, he is underneath a seat in the back of the bus hiding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, that, that what, what a 
what an incredible year. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the, the Mets from a talent standpoint had no business beating the Baltimore Orioles. Uh-huh. Uh, but uh, they, they rose to the occasion. They had great pitching and, you know, and that's what knocked the Mets won 101 games this year, but they ran up against a buzzsaw of pitching with the Padres and they're getting knocked out in the first round. So uh, regular season doesn't always tell you who's going to end up on top. No, but you've been a loyal a fan and there's something fun about having something in life. You're just a loyal fan, you know, where it's like, whatever they are, I'm going to pretend that my cheering makes a difference <laughs> right. and it's okay <laughs> if it doesn't. Right. <laughs> you know, and I understand that and appreciate it. I think that's another good aspect of it. Oh, well, I'm very superstitious. I remember as a kid, I used to throw a ball against the ceiling and I thought if I keep hitting that exact point, then he'll get a hit. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I understand. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful. We'll do more. I invite people, uh, if they want more, let them know. I'm so excited. We're reconnecting, really enjoying it and excited to uh, support you on your journey for being independent. Like I said, I'm an advocate for small and micro businesses and people committed to producing something themselves. And really outside the institutions, not that they don't serve a purpose too, but really getting out there and succeeding at it. So I'm very passionate about the, your journey, continuing to follow it. I'll make sure to put links below so they'll have those as well. Well, and I, I want to publicly say on here before we sign off that, uh, uh, you know, you contacted me, you know, several months ago and. Uh, and you have opened my eyes to a lot of things about, you know, social media and, and so forth that I simply was not aware of. Uh, and so you've been a great, uh, not only a great friend, but also, uh, you know, somebody who has genuinely helped me professionally and continues to help me professionally. And I just want to make sure everybody knows how much I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a great joy. Well, thanks again. Thanks so much. This was a terrific <laughs> journey. I, if you enjoyed it, check out the links. And I do say uh, you can support him and ask questions directly and also make sure to support his sponsor too. So they're all out there. It's all available. And now you can get the official, official, whether <laughs> again, live with as, as long as it takes, right? It's not going to just be one minute. And and my final comment today is, no, I don't know if it's going to snow next week. <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly. You got it. You got it. That's terrific. Thanks so much. You're very welcome, Martin. Take care.